You really had to. And to me, that's that's that five minutes before you you start the meeting. You know, we're always chatty. We can't stop talking. <laughs> I guess I didn't get the memo, so I'll go ahead and mute. <laughs> Good morning. Morning, Dave. Morning, Dave. How are you all the day? Pretty good. Good. Brian, can you turn this on? I need a haircut, and that's about it. Otherwise, you got I one. Do. I said Good I need for one. You. Other than that, my uh, I'm I'm kind of using that as an excuse just to grow it out so I can try and catch up with Mark Trainowitz, but you got a year <laughs> head start on here, so you got a, uh, I got a, I got about a three year head start on you, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't be my first ponytail, put it that way. <laughs> you can't see it from this view anyhow so i think i'm good yeah what kind, of feed, what, kind of, what kind of feedback are you all getting from all of your zoom conferencing oh i think for the most part it's good i mean we haven't tried to do something like this yet where we've got folks from the public who can participate, but generally, I mean, getting business done, it works pretty well. I mean, you know, we're, we're like everybody else, it, the, the conversation isn't maybe as robust, but in other ways you work through an agenda a little quicker. Uh, you maybe miss out on some of the uh, the relationship building that you can, can take advantage of in person, but I think most of us are a little surprised. You know, I worked from home before I had, uh, before I moved to Nebraska and video conferencing wasn't a thing at the time. It was still just all phone. And so it's very different. And, um, but I think it's better. I, I, I just take into it. I mean, it's, it can be a long day when you're just staring at a screen all day, but, um, you know, for getting business done, it works pretty good. How about you, Dave? Uh, I've done, I've done formal mediations two now which last five to six hours so that's an interesting experience and then we've done deposition several depositions and i attended a city council meeting earlier this week uh and so I'll, i that's i'm, I'm going to be curious to see how this meeting goes i thought that meeting went well but there are some uh, issues relative to people talking over each other and you keep and the general public calling in and so it was an interesting experience but it for the most part it was positive yeah i think we found even with um you know we do a fair number of large leadership calls like this and just being able to facilitate it is pretty important yeah uh, taking turns and encouraging conversation but then yeah you get people that both come in at the same time and then that everyone gets gun shy after that so you got to kind of try to build that environment where you just work through that. All right, good morning, everyone. I see some smiling faces this morning. That's a good sign. Sorry, I was stuck on the phone. We were working through technical issues. I think we're all good. We're gonna start promptly at 8.30, which is very shortly, but I think everybody's on and everybody should have control that needs control. So if you need anything, please use the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner and you can communicate with me that way once the meeting starts. Sarah, this is Jim. Can you hear me? Yep, Jim. It's all yours. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, new experience, at least for the Highway Commission here. As I heard somebody saying earlier, there uh, this seems to be the norm anymore. But uh, 
Um, that being the case, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, good morning and thank you for uh, joining us here. Uh, this is the first time one of our meetings have been held virtually, so we appreciate everybody that's uh, turned out for us. Uh, as usual, there will be an opportunity for members of the public to speak at the end of the meeting. Uh, when you entered the meeting, your line was muted. If you do have any questions or want to make comments, please click the hand symbol and Sarah will call on you. Uh, when she unmutes your line, please state and spell your name for the record. So at this time, sir, I would then ask that you call the roll. Sure. Um, for the record, the State Highway Commission is conducting this meeting virtually via WebEx uh, per the executive order issued by Governor Ricketts. The meeting is being recorded. The date is Friday, May 15th, 2020, and the time is 8.31 a.m. Commissioner Koppel. Present. Commissioner Hawks. Present. Commissioner Wolford. Here. Commissioner Fagerland. Commissioner Fagerland. I'm here. Commissioner Kindig. Commissioner Kindig. I believe he's online. He might just be having trouble communicating. Um, Commissioner Gertis. Commissioner Lee Green. Commissioner Lee Green. Okay, I don't think Commissioner Lee Green is on yet. Um, but we do have six in attendance. Okay, with that first order of business uh, on the agenda this morning is the approval of the January 24th, 2020 minutes. Uh, as everyone knows, the March 27th, 2020 meeting was canceled. So Sarah, if you would please call the question. <laughs> Commissioner Koppel. Yes. Commissioner Hawks. Yes. Commissioner Wolford. Um, yeah, you can probably write my name down as moving to approve the minutes. And I'll second. <laughs> that way we'll be correct. <laughs> Sorry, it's all in chat. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Fagerland. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Kindig. Mm, I see your hand raised. Commissioner Gertis. I see her raise her hand and Commissioner Leaf Green. I'm not sure if he's on yet. But again, that's six. Okay, so the minutes are approved. I guess the next item is introductions or announcements. Uh, Sarah, I guess I don't really have any announcements other than to say that it looks like our uh, virtual meeting is working for the most part. I guess as far as introductions, are you aware of who might be with us that we need to uh, recognize? We do have, um, I will mention that Jeannie McClure is on the phone and Katie Wilson with ABC and ACEC. Um, we also have, I believe that those are the two I'll mention for today. The rest of them are all on call, so I can't see their names. Okay. All right. Hey, Sarah, could I interrupt? Doug Lee Green just uh, texted me. He would like you to resend the invite to him. All right, I'll take care of it while we get started. Okay. The same problem I had. Okay, with that, I guess while Sarah's doing that, uh, we appreciate those who are in attendance with us today. And, and uh, it looks like we have some very informative uh, uh, presentations here that uh, we'll look forward to. With that, I'll turn the uh, floor over to Kyle uh, for the director's remarks. Thank you, Jim. I uh, thought for a second on your announcements, you might be announcing your second retirement, but uh, congratulations on your uh, your retirement. I was so sorry I couldn't get up North Platte. Well, no, uh, that's- Certainly we appreciated. 
Yeah, well, and we, we really appreciate all your service to the DOT and to the state, and uh, I'm sure you had a, a large gathering, and, and, you, and I wasn't missed, but I sure missed being there. Well, I did miss Kyle. Gary Thayer was uh, there virtually and uh, had some kind words on the part of DOT also, so I appreciate it. Good, sure. Uh, well, so thanks everybody, and thanks for, for joining us uh, on this virtual commission meeting. It'll it'll be a little bit of a, of a hit and miss, I'm sure. We'll we'll learn some stuff. We'll get better at it. I, I do want to stop and, and thank Sarah and her team at the DOT for putting this together. It is no small effort to put something like this on. We have not used uh, this software for this big of an event at DOT before, so uh, we're learning a lot. Her and her team have been fantastic to get us there. I am getting a little bit of feedback in my headset here. So it looks like maybe Dave Koppel, if you're not muted, maybe you could, maybe it's you. I don't know, I'm just taking a swing there. Uh, so I'll give you a quick update on where we are and then and sort of set up the, the rest of the agenda. You know, uh, we've been pretty busy. If we look back on 2019, sort of the year of the flood, you all remember 3,300 miles of highways closed, 27 bridges out, all of which were open with, most of it with, was with open within days, and then, and then all of them were open within 11 months. And uh, quite an accomplishment. That work still continues, though, and, uh, and Mark and Amy are going to provide an update on that piece of it. And so you flip the calendar to 2020, and we have a different kind of emergency. And for the most part, we haven't skipped a beat. Our projects are still going. We're, we're still delivering projects. Uh, on the engineering side, getting them ready. Uh, we're still responding to emergencies out there on the roadway and construction and maintenance of the highways continues. I have to say in part, that is because of the tremendous leadership we have at the, at the division head and the district engineer level. Um, we've really tried to take a common sense approach to how we are approaching our work here and sort of balancing the needs of our people and our team with the need to get the job done. Uh, Nebraska's, I mean, Nebraskans count on us to have a good highway system. Uh, we saw that during the flood. Uh, we know about the economic impacts that, that it can have to a, to a community or to a business when the roads aren't available. And so keeping, keeping the roads working, but also keeping people working at a time when, when the larger economy is struggling, that's an important part of what we can do at the DOT. And so for lots of reasons, our work has to continue. Uh, much of it is being done remotely. If, you, if we're talking about headquarters, I would guess 85% of the people that are normally in the headquarter campus there here in Lincoln are working remotely. We ramped that up very, very quickly. The folks in our technology support group deserve a ton of credit for getting everybody home quick and productive. Uh, and the key on that side is trying to be flexible for our workforce so that everybody's managing different things at home and different environments and trying to trying to still get the work done and hold, hold people up to that standard, but at the same time, giving people room to manage their life because things are crazy. And, you know, I got a kindergartner and a five-year-old here at the house, and, uh, you know, I, I rely on that flexibility myself just to manage the day. And so we're trying to do that for our folks, too. Uh, some people are still in the office. Sometimes their work is requ uh, requires them to be there. Others just prefer it there. Uh, and so w where we can, we've, we've, we've allowed for that. We're trying to make sure it's safe, spread people out, provide masks, keep the area clean, all those kinds of things. So that's what's happening in the office. In the field, construction and maintenance activities has, for the large part, they've just continued. It, in many ways, it's safer. There's less traffic out there, which we're gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, but, and, and uh, the environment generally is, is safe for social distancing and those kinds of things. But again, we've had to put some protocols in on the job site to encourage more of that, require masks, those kind, or uh, encourage the use of masks when it can't be spread apart and so some of that that is happening but for the large part the work on the on the highways continues and if there's a challenge on that side it's flexibility for our contractors and our industry partners we've had we haven't had any major schedule impacts to projects yet but we have had a few bumps as supplier delays a couple of positive tests on on a crew that required quarantine and making sure the project site was safe and but if we're keeping that safety piece first, keeping our team safe, contractors uh, safe, then we can use that and be understanding and flexible and still get the job done. And in some case, in some cases, that flexibility even means getting the job done faster. We've had projects that we're going to say be delayed because you couldn't work during uh, the College World Series, for example. Well, now uh, we were able to, to start cranking on those faster. So 
approaching each project needs situation as an individual and trying to work through it. Uh, there has been, as you would guess, in, in terms of impacts, uh, revenue uh, impacts are, are a challenge for us. Got more on that later from our CFO, Lynn, and uh, I believe Ryan, Ryan Huff from the strategy office is going to support that as well. Uh, traffic is down, and uh, it's likely to give us a pretty big hit on the revenues. You, you recall last year with the flood, we, we had about $40 million of flood projects that were not reimbursable by the federal government's uh, emergency relief fund. Uh, so $40 million hit last year that we weren't planning for, that we had to try and find a way to navigate through. Uh, this will be bigger, is my guess. It, it's hard to say, will it be two times higher, three times higher, four times higher? I don't think we know yet. It's a little too early to say. And what we're trying to do is balance that uh, sort of need to sort of take it one day at a time, control what we can control, but also be prepared. And that means running scenarios and watching the numbers and the metrics and trying to project forward what kind of damage to our revenues we might see. And we know it will have impact to our program. We just don't know what that extent will be. In some ways, it is a lot like the flood in that we were, you know, we're still getting our hands around what the revenue impacts were months after the flood flooding occurred. And so, you know, normally by now we announce a whole new program. And instead, we're kind of going month by month. And, and that uh, seems like we've been month by month for a long time now when you, when you take into account the flood. Uh, the contracting industry has been a great partner as we work through this. Of course, their understanding, uh, the communication we have with them is very important so they can plan their business and, and support us by, by doing the work, but also being competitive on the bids. And so that relationship is strong and, and something we continue to work on. And, uh, and the one thing that we can do and that we are trying to do is create as much flexibility for ourselves to be able to manage the challenge. And, and that means assessing and looking for flexibility on the federal fund side where that's possible. It means looking at our project priorities, what can what has to happen, what can be moved, uh, and and then working with communities and stakeholders. There are communities who have money in the game on some of these projects. Certainly, they have uh, they've been planning for a long time for maybe a highway improvement project in their community or in their area, and we've been promising to deliver it. So now we have to kind of work through, okay, what what flexibility do we have, and we're working hard to be able to do that. I would expect that you'll have some questions and there'll be some discussion around this revenue piece. I don't want to uh, dwell too much on it during my remarks. I'd like to save them for, for Lynn and Ryan's presentation. I think they'll provide a lot of good context and then we can have a robust discussion on that piece. But uh, if, we, if, you, if you do want to talk about operational kinds of things um, after I conclude my remarks, I would welcome that. And I, and I guess before I end, I would just say, um, you know, we're, we're well positioned to deal with this. It's not an easy challenge but we have great infrastructure in Nebraska. It serves our people well. We have strong partnerships with everybody that we need with, uh, need to be partnered with to deliver and to, to build in this flexibility and, and, uh, and make the right decisions. We have a great team at the DOT. And uh, one thing we are committed to is the communication piece, and that's you know, a project level, program level. Uh, we're doing a lot of things to try and, and communicate to folks about what the impacts to our infrastructure are and how we're trying to address those at DOT. Um, and then one last thing, and I, I try to end every, every session I do with this, and, and that's to remind everybody to buckle up, put your phone down. We had 248 fatalities last year on our highways and roadways. Two thirds of those people were not wearing seatbelts. Uh, we've seen increased distractions. And so what we really need to do with that 248, we gotta make uh, an impact. We have to bring that number down uh, too many people, too many Nebraskans losing their lives, and the best thing we can do is wear our seatbelts and tell our friends and tell our family to do so, and then put your phone down when you're driving. Focus on the road. If you do those two things, uh, it's the best thing you can do to be safe and, and protect you and protect your family. Uh, eventually, we are, we are in the middle of trying to ramp up a campaign to promote this, these two things, to put, buckle up and put your phone down. Eventually, we'll be leveraging partnerships to do that. We've had a little bit of a of a bump, as you can imagine, with the, with the COVID-19 response, but we're working through some things and eventually will be something that you'll see in lots of places and we'll be asking for your help to help spread that word. So, uh, Jim, that's all I have, but I'm happy to take any questions. Like I said, if we could keep the questions uh, off the revenue piece until, until Ryan and Lynn can give us more context, that would be great. But otherwise, I'm open to any questions or, uh, or remarks. 
Thank you, Kyle. Uh, any questions for the director? If not, I guess uh, next up is Lynn and uh, we'll get into the revenue part. Um, the revenue and traffic uh, count dashboard. So with that, Lynn, if you would please address the commission. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Um, uh, Sarah, if you could move to the next slide, I think you, yep, there you go. So, yeah, th and thanks again. Uh, as Kyle mentioned, my name is Lynn Heaton. I'm NDOT CFO. I've been with the department since June of 2018. And uh, this is my first opportunity to speak to the commission. So, uh, again, good morning. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So, uh, this first slide, um, I just want to lay, you know, some background for you. This first slide summarizes Nebraska's highway user revenues as a starter for us today. Uh, NDOT's three main highway trust fund revenue sources are motor fuel tax in the upper left, sales tax on motor vehicles just below that, and um, motor vehicle registration fees, which is in the upper middle. Um, you, as you can see, uh, well, currently the gas tax is set at 29.3 cents. That's as of January 1 of this year. Um, and the just breaking that down, the fixed and LB610 rate is a total of 16.3 cents. The variable rate, uh, which is 100% uh, goes to the Department of Transportation, is 2.8 cents. And the wholesale rate is 10.2 cents currently, and that's the total 29.3. The wholesale rate is split 66% um, to the department and the remainder to cities and counties. Uh, NDOT's share of revenues from motor fuels has averaged about $23 million per month over la the last one to two years. NDOT's share of motor vehicle registration revenue has averaged about 3.5 million per month. And uh, the department's share of motor vehicle sales tax revenue has averaged about $11 million per month, all of this pre-COVID-19. <clears throat> so in NDOT's total average monthly highway trust fund revenue is about $36 million per month. Uh, we also receive an average of almost $6 million uh, per month of sales tax revenue under the Build Nebraska Act, which is in the uh, middle bottom portion of, the, of this slide. So just that, that's just to give a backdrop of a uh, high level of our, our main revenue sources to provide some context. Next slide, please. So this text might get a little small, um, but I'll try to describe it for you. Uh, this shows NDOT's April revenues. So this is how we were doing essentially pre-pandemic. There's a little bit of impact here, uh, but um, uh, it does show um, April monthly in the center and then to the right fiscal year to date for each of our revenues, uh, revenue sources. Um, Prior to the pandemic, NDOT's revenues were doing quite well relative to uh, the most recent forecast uh, developed in December. Uh, in April, uh, as expected with the public health directives announced in uh, on you know, mid-March and the related impact on revenue generating economic activity, we began to see some signs of weakening, and you can see that in April, particularly if you look at um, the, the motor fuel taxes and registrations. So the motor fuel taxes you see here for April is March consumption. And so with the, uh, that mid-month, um, uh, the, the mid-month uh, uh, public health direct announcement of the public health directives and the related social distancing, you can see that um, Motor fuel taxes um, were down 7% from forecast in, uh, in April, uh, again, which represents March fuel consumption. 
Motor vehicle registrations uh, were down 14.2% in April versus forecast. Again, that uh, represents March payment of uh, motor vehicle registrations. And uh, likely in, uh, impacted by the, the closure of the county offices and uh, to the public and the governor's executive order suspending uh, registration deadlines um, to 30 days following the lifting of the emergency declaration for COVID-19. So we believe that that's certainly, an Im we're seeing that impact uh, began to be seen in, in April. Motor vehicle sales tax was still strong in April, uh, beating forecast by 11.2%. Uh, but these revenues represent mainly economic activity prior to March. NDOT's Build Nebraska Act revenues are credited to the um, State Highway Capital Improvement Fund, which is about halfway down the page. Uh, this would be general state sales taxes. Uh, still strong in April, but this, that strength is due to a two-month lag. And um, uh, the April BNA revenues represent pre-pandemic taxable sales. Um, so really, as you can see over to the right, fiscal year to date, um, Highway Cash Fund, which is NDOT's share of Highway Trust Fund revenues, uh, even including the, the effect that we began to see in April, still 1.1% better than forecast on the Highway Cash Fund. Uh, the State Highway Capital Improvement Fund, which is BNA revenues, beating forecasts still through the end of April by 6.4%. And um, so doing well overall uh, through April still. Next slide, please, Sarah. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the, I mentioned the the three main uh, revenue sources for the Highway Trust Fund, and uh, one being, uh, and the major one for the Highway Trust Fund is, um, is motor fuel taxes. So there's a, there is a lag uh, on when we begin to see revenues from uh, following fuel consumption, but one, one thing that uh, we have available to us uh, from Ryan Huff's Strategic Planning Division is traffic volume data. Um, and, and so this is among the various sources we turn to for data, and uh, you know we have both internal and external sources, but this one is internal and we're glad to have it on, a, on the revenue forecasting side. It, it certainly can be helpful. Um, for motor fuel tax, uh, since there is an approximate one month lag, as I mentioned, um, uh, this, this information um, uh, sort of gives us a leading indicator, if you will, about what will the, uh, the motor fuel tax revenues will be. Uh, NDOT maintains a, a system of 67 continuous traffic counters statewide. Um, these are often called uh, traffic, automatic traffic recorders or ATRs. Uh, the counters collect traffic volume and classification data 24 hours per day, seven days per week. Uh, data is then relayed to NDOT twice per week. Uh, the historical dashboard um, compares 2020's traffic counts to the historical three-year uh, average of 2016 through 2018 uh, for each day of the week uh, for that month, and then averages the difference in traffic for each week by, the category, by that category. Uh, data for 2019 was excluded uh, due to the uh, flooding and the impacts on uh, uh, travel during that time period. So, for example, March uh, 15th through March 21st, uh, one of the earlier weeks, was calculated by finding the difference in Sunday, March 15, 2020, versus the three-year historic average Sunday traffic for March. Monday, March 16, 2020, uh, was compared versus the three-year historic average of Mondays in March, and that was done for each day. Uh, then they're averaged, each day is averaged together to get a weekly average change in traffic. So we, the department then aggregates that data into various categories, as you see on the slide. 
So late March and early traffic volume data showed approximately 30% decline in traffic volume. April 13 through uh, 18 coincided with a fairly widespread winter event. So that uh, shows a 35% decline below the 2016 through 2018 average. And, um, but as you can see, improvement has been seen since late April. Uh, and uh, also continuing into early May, um, likely due to warmer weather, uh, but also, as you probably know, the uh, changing or revisions of, to some of the public health, uh, directed health measures um, likely is it causing some improvement there, and we'll continue to monitor this each week. The, the reduction in traffic counts um, that we've seen is mostly related to passenger vehicles. Freight traffic has stayed at near normal levels throughout the past two months. Uh, further improvement is expected to be gradual as the directed health measures are lifted and, um, and consumer behaviors adjust to the new circumstances. Next slide, please, Sarah. So NDOT has made the traffic volume data available on our website. Uh, in a COVID-19 traffic count dashboard, uh, which you see on your screen now. And this is updated weekly by uh, the strategic planning division staff, uh, well, by the IT staff uh, using data from strategic planning division. Next slide, please. So on sales tax on motor vehicles, um, Various data indicates motor vehicle sales are down by 40 to 50 percent nationally. For instance, data from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis shows total motor vehicle sales nationally were down 32 percent in March 2020 compared to February, and about the same percentage compared to March 2019. The April data was released earlier this week and shows a continued decline nationally, with sales down 49% in April compared to February and also down 48% compared to April of 2019. So fairly precipitous decline in motor vehicle sales. Now, Nebraska has not had the closure of dealerships included under our directed health measures, as has been the case in some other states. Um, so I, we think that the uh, impact in Nebraska may be uh, not quite so um, severe. Um, however, there certainly uh, is an impact. Uh, in fact, a recent conversation uh, earlier this week, week that I had with the Nebraska New Car and Truck Dealers Association um, indicated their informal survey of 70 dealers statewide uh, points to sales being down approximately 30% over the past two weeks. Um, and uh, they have uh, graciously offered to continue to update me on those, um, on their informal surveys as they go forward. Uh, they've, they've also advised that sales are trending up uh, compared to uh, the earlier uh, weeks of the pandemic following the DHMs. Uh, and certainly manufacturers are doing their part with very favorable incentives, such as 0% interest for 72 months and no payments due initially on financing. So uh, that might, uh, certainly that would, uh, that helps. Next slide. So on motor vehicle registration fees, I want to touch a little bit on the closure of the county offices and the executive order. Um, delaying or extending due dates. Um, so it, you can see the map on the right is uh, the most recent update from NACO showing uh, county court uh, courthouse um, availability to the public. And you can see the vast majority of the state, the uh, courthouses are um, suspending public access uh, to offices. And um, so this prevents in-person payment of registration fees and motor vehicle sales tax. And further than on the left, you can see a, a release from the governor's office. This is executive order, this release on executive order 20-05, uh, which extends due dates for payment of registration fees and sales taxes. Uh, and that's also having an effect um, with really the, the impact difficult to estimate 
because um, some people, some counties do have the ability to have online registration renewal, um, and some county offices are open. Uh, and like I said, the, the availability of the online registration renewal certainly helps to mitigate the impact. Our expectation is that uh, the impact on motor vehicle registrations is mainly an issue of timing rather than one that involves prolonged sizable reductions in this revenue source. Um, however, the more acute impact um, in the short term, uh, given their, their relative size, is not the impact on registration fees, but on payment of sales tax on motor vehicle purchases. Um, we reached out to the Department of Motor Vehicles who uh, collects information from counties. Uh, and this is a, about a month or two, some maybe even two months earlier than we would typically see uh, this information come to the Highway Trust Fund. But preliminary data from the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, suggests that May Highway Trust Fund revenue on motor vehicle sales tax could be down about 50 to 60 percent. And so uh, probably a combination, like I said, of sales being down, but also just the inability of people to make those in-person payments. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, revenue forecasting in the, the COVID-19 world will be dynamic. Um, there's no recent historical example to examine and no partner state DOTs that have experienced anything like this event uh, to turn to for guidance. Um, uh, you know, the, the revenue impact could change significantly from month to month. Um, uh, the, the most uncertain elements uh, of this revenue forecasting effort are related to the potential scope and duration. Uh, as well as the correlation of consumer behavior to the directed health measures and social distancing guidance. Um, one thing we don't know is uh, how soon would a vaccine be available, for instance, and widely available. Um, is, uh, um, is, is the, the uh, efforts to find uh, medicines that, that sort of uh, make the symptoms less severe, would that have an impact? on uh, consumer behavior or on the, the DHMs. Um, many are suggesting that the impacts to state DOTs could go on for as long as 18 months, at least until a, a vaccine becomes widely available. One thing that does seem uh, relatively certain is that teleworking and the related negative impact on fuel consumption could very well be here to stay for much longer than the pandemic itself. Uh, but um, that's certainly, um, it's working well for us to close. Uh, and uh, this meeting being done virtually is an, an example of that. So uh, with that, thank you for your time. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I'm sure Lynn will be available for questions if we have any at this point. I, well, I guess I one of the questions have. I would have for you is, is what is this doing to your project scheduling or how are you you dealing with that? Yeah. Uh, things related to the, the COVID-19. Um, the, uh, but we, you know, as, as more data becomes available, um, we're certainly going to keep in a close eye. We have uh, regular meetings uh, about um, the impact and uh, our program planning process, so. Other questions for Lynn? Lynn, was Ryan also going to present? <laughs> Ryan, I'm glad Ryan's here. It was in the event there were any technical questions on the, the traffic data collection. Okay. Um, so uh, so I, if there are any questions on that, I may have to turn to him. Is, well, hearing, hearing I, nothing. 
Wait, wait, wait. I just had one question come through um, regarding the April report, Lynn, that you were mentioning. Um, wanting to know if that's available on the website. Uh, yes, very soon. Um, it is a, one of the pages in our monthly financial report, which is available on NDOT's website. Um, we should have that uh, April monthly report um, online early next week. Okay. Okay, that was the last question I had come through. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, if no further questions on that, I know that we're all concerned about the economic impact uh, and what this is going to mean. I know that we've been watching that very closely at the city here, too, or at least we were here. Um, so I think a, a lot of interest in that. Uh, next on the agenda uh, is construction cost inflation. Uh, Mark, are you uh, on board with us here this morning and ready to address the commission? I am. Thank you, Commissioner Hawks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Eggie. I'm a data scientist with High Street, and we're the prime contractor on the linking infrastructure challenges with data or linked project. The purpose of which is to support the use of data and data analytics to inform Nebraska DOT's decision making and operations. I appreciate the opportunity to join you this morning. And as we get started, I'd like you to imagine that you're planning to take your family to Europe for a vacation. You've made your budget, you've saved your money, and you go to buy your plane tickets, and you find that in the year since you made your budget, the price to fly your family to Europe has gone up by 50%. What do you do? When prices go up rapidly and unexpectedly, it can really interfere with your plans. And of course, the same goes for construction projects. And lately, this has been more of a real example than a hypothetical example. So I've been asked to take a look at recent cost data and see if there's trends with implications for costs for Nebraska DOT's upcoming program projects. And I'm here this morning to share with you those results. Next slide. So this morning, I have information to share with you about overall construction cost inflation, which specific pay items are driving that cost inflation, and how that inflation is being reflected in the DOT's estimates. Next slide. Let's begin with construction cost inflation. How have costs changed at a program level? How much asphalt does a million dollars buy this year compared to a million dollars last year? Next slide. One of the big things that drives this is how much your contractors are paying for their materials. What I have here on, what I have here on screen is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that shows what contractors nationwide are paying for key inputs, including cement, asphalt, and engineering services. And note that the cost of, much, of materials is much more responsive to economic conditions than engineering labor. I've also included on this chart, uh, Federal Highway Administration's National Highway Construction Cost Index. And I'd just like to point out that you can see that there's a strong correlation between the NHCCI and the prices that your contractors are facing for cement and asphalt. Next slide. Uh, here's another view of the, uh, of the same NHCCI data. Uh, starting in 2004, you can see that price increases of 10% year over year are not without precedent. Uh, we see strong inflation leading up to the recession in 2000 and, uh, 2008, a correction in 2009, and then a period of relative price stability between 2013 and 2017. In 2018 and 2019, we see the strongest price increases for construction costs that we've observed since prior to the recession in 2008. 6% inflation in 2018 and 7% in 2019. Next slide. Uh, in this slide, we see the same information, but with Nebraska DOT's historic inflation estimates. And the key takeaway here is that price changes in Nebraska correlate to what's happening on a national level, but they're not the same. For example, in the last recession, prices went down 12% nationally in 2009, but they didn't drop in Nebraska. We were, uh, we were asked here at High Street to bring Nebraska's inflation estimates up through 2020. Next slide. So we did that by applying a standard price index methodology based on bid prices since 2012, excluding a few major outliers like the emergency response projects last year. Next slide. And based on that methodology, this is our estimate for Nebraska, which you can see is fairly close to FHWA's national estimate for the last few years. We've measured 5% inflation in 2018, 7% inflation in last year, 
and are estimating 12% annualized inflation for 2020, based on the bids received through the end of March. Obviously, that could change for the rest of the year. Next slide. So that's, a, that's at a program level, but those increases are not distributed uniformly across all projects. Recall that cement costs have gone up a lot faster than engineering costs. So we looked, uh, so we looked at specific pay items to determine what's driving changes in contract award amounts. Next slide. So in this analysis, we looked at a data set of 88 pay items that constitute 80% of the DOT's total spending and compared prices prior to the 2019 flooding to the prices since, looking for evidence of consistent price increases. Next slide. And rather than tell you what we found, let me show you. So each of the following charts shows one single pay item, one of those 88. Uh, and many of these pay items exhibit economies of scale. That is, the, the unit price goes down when the total quantity you buy goes up. So we show the total contract quantity on the horizontal axis of these charts. There's a line of best fit for the pre-flood prices in red and the post-flood prices in blue. So what you see on this chart is that since 2019, the median price per day for a pilot vehicle has increased from $475 to $500. And there's no economies of scale. Uh, you pay $500 for one day or $500 per day for 100 days. Next slide. Um, so that was, that, was, that was an example to introduce you to the charts. Uh, he, here we have uh, data for excavation or, or earthworks. Uh, at lower quantities on the left-hand side of the chart, we see that price is about 40% higher uh, now than they were prior to uh, the flooding in 2009. And at higher quantities, there's still about a 15% gap between prices. Next slide. Uh, we see something similar for, uh, for reinforcing steel, maybe a 10 to 30% increase uh, in basically year over year, depending on the, the quantity uh, going into the particular project. Next slide. Uh, for concrete, we have two different types of concrete here. Uh, we see something similar, maybe a 15 to 20% increase, uh, kind of regardless of the quantity. Next slide. Uh, but this doesn't apply to all of the DOT's pay items. Uh, here on the left, uh, we have two charts showing asphalt. You see that asphalt prices haven't changed much. And on the right, prices for binder, we actually see that binder prices have gone down in the last year. Next slide. So when we think about 12% statewide inflation, it's actually more than 12% for some key pay items like earthwork, steel, and concrete. And the implication here is that capital improvement projects, which tend to entail significant quantities of earthwork, concrete, and steel, are likely to see a greater cost impact than system preservation projects, which are more asphalt and binder. Next slide. So then how is this affecting cost estimates? Next slide. As a project develops, its estimates go from general ratios in its early days to exact quantities when it goes to letting. This process often takes several years during which inflation can move prices in unpredictable ways. Next slide. The DOT assigns a status number to each of the estimates in a project's life cycle, development life cycle, where the 30 status has rough quantities and the 50 status is the final estimate with exact quantities for letting. Next slide. So to understand what's happening with Nebraska DOT's estimates, we looked at 114 bridge, asphalt, and concrete projects having reached 50 status in the last 40 years. And the change in the estimate amount between the draft 30 estimate and the final 50 status estimate. Next slide. So this chart shows the percent change in a project's estimate between its draft and final estimate grouped by the year in which the estimate was finalized. The blue dashed line in each column is the average change for all the projects within a given year. And when reading the chart, pay attention in each year to how closely clustered the points are around that average line. In 2017, the average was close to a 1% decrease between draft and final. In 2018, a 1% increase, a little bit more spread. In 2019, we start to see some bias. There's an 8% increase between draft and final status estimate on average. And in 2020, among the projects finalized so far, the projects have increased an average of 26%. And there's much greater dispersion around that average. So we can see that not only are the estimates trending up, but that volatility is increasing over time as well. Next slide. 
So we can use regression analysis to estimate what might happen to projects currently in 30 status that we're anticipating will reach their final status estimate in the, in the coming months. And while you saw on the previous slide that there's a huge range recently and how that's changing, the data suggests that on average, this will continue to trend up on the order of 10 to 20% for asphalt projects, 15 to 30% for bridge projects, and 20 to 40% for concrete projects. Next slide. So to recap, in the last few years, we've entered an era of rapid price inflation. Six to 8% in the last two years, 12% at an annualized rate in the first quarter of 2020. Earthwork, concrete, and steel prices have been driving much of that overall cost inflation, meaning that inflation is likely to impact capital improvement projects more than system preservation projects. And for major projects that are currently in their 30 status or currently have a 30 status estimate, you should expect to see substantial increases when those estimates are updated and finalized this year. Of course, everything that I just said was current as of about three weeks ago. What the coming months will bring uh, is, is anyone's guess, but that's where we are today. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Mark. Uh, questions for Mark? Well, I think it's a very interesting presentation, Mark. Uh, I jotted down several notes here and uh, it will be interesting to see what happens here as we uh, see some of the results from the Corona situation uh, coming into play with some of these uh, statistics. Jim, if I could too, and um, you know, when you think about the two things combined, the, the escalation we've seen in prices, and now the pressures we're feeling on the revenue side, it's starting to, you know, you can feel the squeeze at the DOT and what that, what that may mean to us. And as you all know, there are several projects this year on that capital improvement spectrum that we're trying to get done, that we've been making promises to communities for a long time. And uh, we certainly want to keep those promises, but it's getting, it's getting tight. So uh, lots to, to uncover still, you know, we, we don't know how this will affect prices. We don't know what the revenue impacts will be, but, but uh, the two together really, really put us in a, in a position where we have to be pretty flexible and ready to respond uh, to deliver in, in a whole host of different ways. So Mark's team uh, and the folks at DOT who've been working with him, Jim Knott and others down in the construction office, this uh, research has really helped us to understand what that spectrum of, of uh, challenges may be. And so we thought it would be great to share with you. And Mark, thanks for presenting. Thanks for the opportunity. Kyle. Kyle. Kyle, this is Jim again. One of the questions yeah. I had is, through any of this federal stimulus stuff that's coming down, is there anything in there? I know I've been watching it from the municipal level, but uh, is there anything in there that would come back to help the state, at least as far as transportation goes? I know there was some talk about some money in transit, but I guess I was just curious if there was anything else. Sure. Uh, well, so the, there are conversations and, and that's, uh, there seems to be an acknowledgement amongst those in Congress and in Washington that there are a lot of impacts to state and local governments, not just at DOTs. Uh, the, there, there have been uh, discussions and I think the House maybe uh, passed a bill recently in the last few days that had some, some state government aid and specifically for DOTs in it. I think there's still a long ways for it to go before it gets to become law, as I understand uh, those negotiations. I think the other piece that's, that's maybe more interesting to me is the, the bills that have already passed Congress. There aren't, you can't use any of those relief funds for, uh, to replace lost revenues. And uh, so it, the, the money that's in there for governments is designed to support the spending necessary to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. But I think there is some discussion that there is enough 
there are enough funds in there that if you were to relax that in some way and allow it to be used in certain places for lost revenues, that might actually benefit states more. And I know that's a, those are conversations that are happening. So there's, there's discussion about something down the road and there's discussion about what if we open up what we've already passed and just allow it to be used for a few other things. And, um, you know, we, I try not to get caught up in the sort of day-to-day uh, discussions that I, or rumors that you hear out of what may be happening in Congress, but I know that at a DOT level, talking with my colleagues and our peers across the country, uh, talking with folks uh, in the state government here, those are the kind of options that we're looking at. I, I, Elaine Chow from USDOT said recently that she does expect there will be support coming from the federal government for DOTs. But she said, I don't know when. And so, um, you know, like everything else these days, we're taking it uh, one day at a time. But it's nice to know that there is discussion and that it's, uh, that it's something that I think generally has support. Getting it through all the, the hurdles, I think it's hard to say when it'll occur. Um, I think I saw Dave unmuted for there for a second, Jim. I don't know if Dave had a question as well. For, given the statistical data that was presented today uh, and the historically low interest rates that exist today, uh, is there discussion as to uh, attempting to find some type of financing vehicle to take advantage of the historically low interest in order to avoid the inflation factor that uh, apparently exists with the products for construction? Thanks, Dave. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, uh, as you know, the, the state has been a pay-as-you-go state in Nebraska for a long, long time. And, uh, but we have tried to find opportunities to use different innovations and contracting to get things done in different ways when it makes sense. And you saw that with the Lincoln South Beltway and the way that we've tried to structure that project. I don't think, Commissioner Koppel, we've seen a large interest at this time in, in you know, let's pass a, uh, a traditional bonding program. I don't, I don't hear that. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges with the cost is the, the contracting community, I believe is pretty, they're not, they're not so full they can't still bid but they're not exactly hurting for work after all the flood extra projects that came on. I think that's driving costs in some ways. And so we have to balance those kinds of things. I, I certainly appreciate the argument. It's, it's one that, um, you know, that I think we hear a lot and is worth having a conversation about. Uh, we're operating under the current statutes and, uh, and, and approach and philosophy, which is that we were a pay as you go state. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on that at this time? If not, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, the 2019 emergency response flood update. Uh, Mark, are you with us? And Amy? I am here, but I think Amy's gonna go first. Okay. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Starr. I've been with the NDOT for about 25 years in a combination of roadway design, materials and research. And then in the last eight years, I've been serving as the program management engineer. Since the historic flood of 2019, we've been working closely with our federal, state and local partners to access reimbursement for over 250 damage sites on the state and local federal aid route in 48 different Nebraska counties. So this morning, I'm gonna be summarizing uh, that damage and our road to reimbursement. And then I'll turn it over to Mark Trainowitz, our bridge engineer, and he's gonna be sharing with you some of the amazing views and widespread damage um, and the expedited repairs that have been made to the state highway system. Next slide, please. So the state of Nebraska has been on the road to recovery since spring of 2019, and a lot of you have been on that road with us. At one point, the state system had 
3,300 miles closed and 27 bridge impassable. And today, all of the state highways and bridges that were once impassable because of these events are open to traffic. Construction, construction on a couple of those locations are still on, ongoing and they're wrapping up this year and Mark is gonna go into a lot greater detail on those. But so far, the damage to the state and local federal aid routes alone are estimated at about $200 million. Approximately a quarter of that, or about $50 million of those expenses are occurred on the local federal aid routes that are managed by cities and counties. And the remaining is on the state highway transportation system. Next slide, please. So this graphic is a nice representation of the steps that we need to get through to be able to um, receive federal reimbursement from the emergency relief program. But in general, a team assesses each damage site, estimates the repair, and then just as with any standard federally funded construction program, you need to get through all of the typical steps like getting environmental clearances and permits and certifications and itemized paid invoices are also needed for reimbursement. So the state and local public agencies pay for the damage repairs first and then are reimbursed 80 to 100% of those expenses after the federal aid eligibility decisions are, and requirements are met. So in general, as um, Kyle mentioned earlier, NDOT estimates 30 to $40 million of the flood expenses on the state system won't be reimbursed. And that's attributed to um, requirements such as the match that we need to, um, to provide or sites that are ineligible because they're too small or various different reasons. But the good news is that Nebraska was allocated quick emergency relief in two installments for about half of our estimated damage. First, about $25 million of the emergency re re Nebraska received was made available immediately, almost immediately, and that was reserved for the cities and counties. And very soon after, additional $68 million of emergency relief was made available for re reimbursement, um, and that is being available, that, that is primarily available for the state federal aid routes. <clears throat> We've since requested the remainder of the ER funds, about $78 million, uh, for the damage statewide, and we'll, we are awaiting the next congressional action. Next slide, please. So we've been working hard with all of our partners since the spring of 2019, and this sum table summarizes how much progress we've made towards reimbursement. Of the $50 million of estimated damage to the local system, we currently estimate about 40 million of that to be reimbursable, and to date, 8 million has been reimbursed to 21 different counties, including four counties that have been, been reimbursed all of the reimbursable damage to their system. We've also accomplished about 80% of the steps that need to be accomplished for all of that reimbursement. The local assistance division also has a website that provides regular updates to each damage site for the local um, public agencies so that they can see what steps they need to accomplish for each damage site in order to make progress for reimbursement within their jurisdiction. The state damage is estimated at about $150 million, and of that, $130 million is estimated eligible for reimbursement. We've accomplished $30 million worth of reimbursement so far, and there are two damage sites that those that Mark will speak a lot about today on Highway 281 and Highway 12 that make up nearly $75 million worth of the expenses. Um, to date, about $60 million have been paid out on those, those damage sites. So next up, Mark will be sharing a lot more information about these damage sites and provide a little bit more context on the damage and the repairs that have occurred to date. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks, Amy. And, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak in front of you today uh, to give an update. Um, on our flood recovery. I, I apologize to the call-in um, participants. I've got a lot of photos and you're not gonna be able to see anything, but uh, it really, um, most of you have seen, you know, many of these photos. I really just wanted to give an update and, and just, I guess, reflect back um, a year, a little over a year ago and, and really what it looked like on our, on our system. Uh, the picture on the right shows Highway 281 uh, downstream of the Spencer Dam, <clears throat> what it looked like just a few days after the flood. And uh, just to put it in perspective, the, the bridge that you see on the upper part of the photos is a 650 foot long bridge. 
Uh, the opening, the new channel opening is about 1800 feet. So um, again, you've, you've probably seen this before, but just to remind you of the massive damage. <clears throat> the guy on the left um, was one of our bridge inspectors that was up at Niobrara. Um, this was on the Saturday, the, uh, you know, the storm hit Wednesday night into Thursday. And, you know, just a reminder of what the ice looked like as, uh, as people first got on site. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna highlight the, the major flood recovery projects. Amy talked about 250 sites, um, damaged sites across the state. Uh, I'm gonna talk about just these 15 or so, 17 or so projects. And these are the projects that we really try to keep people filled in on um, as we went last year. Uh, the bridge you see here is Highway 11 south of Butte. And you can see the amount of ice um, that was stacked up on top of this bridge um, just right after the storm. And it, it took a while for this ice to melt away. Uh, next slide, please. So West Dodge Expressway, um, the bottom left, you can see um, this was the Sunday after the storm hit. This was March 17th. Um, the water had just started to go down. The district engineer, Tim Weander, and I were on site that day. And you can, um, if you can tell by this picture, the uh, the westbound lanes are on the right side where it's where the water is calm. The the eastbound lanes are the left side that we're looking down. <clears throat> in the basically the, um, uh, the the soil underneath the pavement, about three feet of it got washed away, and the, and the pavement settled. So after about two months um, of work, the we had this expressway back open. Of course, a major link um, if you're trying to get west of Omaha. Really, the only way to get out of Omaha to the west at, at, um, after March 17th was to take the interstate. So all the links going west were closed. So this was um, pretty major to get this, uh, to this roadway open. Next slide. Uh, south of Schuyler, um, this is just shows some of the damaged pictures um, on the right. Uh, you know, one of the one of the initial assessments um, on the on the bottom left, you can see how you know just this this flow of ice, how it damaged these um, steel support piling. Um, the, the one you can see at the on the very end, it just wiped it completely out. The others, <clears throat> it completely damaged them. This site um, was open for one lane of traffic by June first, and then both lanes. The, so we had only one lane because we could only we only got about half the bridge done, so it could open. And then on June 24th, uh, all both lanes are open for traffic. Next slide, please. East of Nickerson, um, pretty interesting. If you look at the upper right picture, you can see where the river makes a bend. And it once it got out of its banks, it just came down across and went right through the roadway. And you can see that on the bottom left. This was one we went back in um, and uh, jumped right back on it and got and had the contractor uh, basically take we took the as built plans and put the road back together um, as according to when it was the first time it was built. Next slide please. West of Arlington on Highway 91, uh, similar to the one I just showed you, you know, the river came through, wiped the road out, and it was just um, it was a battle number one to get the to get the water stopped. And then to just to get the equipment out there and get this filled in and get it paid back. And you can see now this one was open uh, June 15th. So, you know, it was interesting at the time. As we look at these, it seems like, you know, it, we got these things put back together pretty quickly and we did. But boy, at the time it was, you know, every day we were we were talking about these things and, you know, a few times a day. And, and it, it seemed like it, it took a long, long time when you're right in the middle of it. But as you look back, uh, you know, our industry got a lot accomplished in a very short amount of time last year. Next slide, please. So south of Genoa, this is uh, Highway 39. Uh, the actually the, the canal system uh, got out of its out of its banks, went across a couple of fields, actually got in our road ditch. So this is the, the, the road ditch here that you see on the left. The whole canal system water flow was flowing down this this road ditch went down, cut back through the road and made it back to the Loop, uh, to the loop River. So um, this was pretty extensive. You know, this, this cut through here where this water eroded, it was about 15 feet deep. So 
you know, it, it, when you see it from the top like this, it doesn't look so bad, but uh, when you get right down to it, um, if, if you could see in the bottom left picture, there's a, there's a person standing on the pavement uh, farther up, uh, up in the picture. That's just looks like a very small thing, but that's, that's a, you know, a person. So you can see the, the extensive damage that happened here. Um, this picture shows uh, a drone footage, you know, a photo from a, a drone flight. We really did, um, we really started using drones a lot during the flood. Um, we were just kind of scratching the surface before the flooding started. And we could see, you know, through this that the, the drone system was a really good way to get out and assess our damage. We could actually get to places that we just literally couldn't walk to. We just could not get to where that we could get drones in there and take some, take some good footage for us. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the same highway, but this is south of the river. So we had damage north of the river, and then we also had damage to this bridge south of the river. Um, this bridge had to be completely replaced um, because of the damage to it. But very quickly, we got, um, we knew we couldn't get the bridge open for traffic in a very short amount of time. So we put a shoe fly in, so at least we could have one lane of traffic. We got that open by July 19th. And then the bridge um, was completely open and the road was open for two lanes of traffic by November 25th. Uh, next slide, please. This is Spencer Dam project. Um, this was the one I, the, the, the first picture I showed you. Um, if, if you, uh, you know, if you look at this site, this site and the Niobrara site. So we've got, um, we've got these large openings where there really weren't large openings before. You know, this one, all, all the water has moved from that bridge you see in the distance to this new opening through the uh, road embankment. So I find it um, interesting that, our, that we had consultant help on both these projects to just go in and figure out, okay, where is the new bridge going to go? How's this channel going to change over time? Where do we put the temporary bridge? July 26, we opened a temporary bridge. Um, you can see it there. It's a 600-foot bridge. Um, on the left, on the right side of that is a contractor platform, and then past that is where the new bridge is going in. Um, these are the latest pictures that were taken just a couple of weeks ago, and you can see on the upper right, you can see a couple um, lines of girders are already set on the substructure. So the contractor is moving right along on, on getting the, uh, the permanent bridge open. The traffic's been reestablished since July 26th on this project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a little bit more on the Spencer Dam project. It's a little bit further uh, distant view from on the right top. You can see the girders <clears throat> that have been set on this project. And then the bottom left um, was just a picture. It, this, was, this was taken in the winter time. You know, the, the contractor didn't stop working during the winter. And this one just, I think it shows that, you know, it's, it's pretty extreme conditions out there. You know, these guys are out there. These people are out there trying to, to build a bridge and there's ice and there's water flow and uh, you know really dangerous situations but they kept plugging along and really doing a great job for us uh, next slide please this is west center west of um, west center road west of omaha <clears throat> another major link as you go west um, the bottom left shows the bridge that now the, the river bridge the elkhorn river bridge um, survived the storm this is the next bridge to the west uh, that typically doesn't see much water flow, if any. It only sees water flow when, when water gets out of the main river channel. And this was very extensive. Um, some of the scour at, at these piers was about 40 feet deep. So uh, we had to go in and replace this bridge. Uh, you can see the, the new bridge on the right uh, that was open July 31st. So. You know, some of the others we talked about getting temporary structures in or putting pavement back in place, but this is a brand new bridge that they built and opened by, um, by the end of July. Next slide, please. So this is Highway 116 south of Dixon. Um, most of the roads, when, um, when the bridges washed out, most of the roads were underwater. So you just couldn't get to the bridges. So there wasn't a lot of um, people falling into the, into the washouts, you know, driving into the washouts. This particular road was open to traffic. 
So luckily, um, our district pe uh, personnel knew that we had some timber pile under this bridge that, that probably weren't in the best condition. This bridge had been scheduled to be replaced soon. So one of our district uh, people went under, saw that there was about six timber piling missing and closed the bridge immediately. Um, you know, this one could have been very bad if, if we would have had some uh, trucks trying to drive across this bridge and the bridge collapsing, you know, after the flooding. So you can see on the right that we've got a really a temporary system set up to support this bridge uh, until we get it replaced in the next year or two. Uh, next slide, please. This is the Niobrara West project. Um, this is the project where the Mormon Canal Bridge floated away. If you see on the, the, the left picture, there is a bridge in the distance sitting in the trees. Um, that's a 360 foot bridge that um, basically the ice flow picked up and uh, floated downstream. Uh, that bridge is a little bit more than 4 million pounds. So to think about a 4 million pound bridge getting moved off its supports, picked up and, and moved downstream is, is pretty impressive. Uh, this is a similar, it's a, the temporary bridge on the left, um, 600 foot long. You got the uh, contractor's construction platform. Uh, this bridge, um, the temporary structure, the road got uh, reestablished by August 10th. This one shows the Mormon Canal Bridge, but in the distance is actually the, uh, also the Niobrara River Bridge that they had to do some extensive work to before they could get this road open to traffic. Um, you know, this was another one that the, the hydraulics has completely changed through here over time. Um, you know, this used to be a, a smaller opening. Now most of the water has been diverted through this channel. So um, the hydraulics is much, much different than it was when this, uh, when the existing bridge was first built. So the consultants really had to do uh, in, in coordinating coordination with us, we really had to make some decisions quickly on where does this new bridge go? Um, how do we put it in? What do we do? Um, so really designs that would normally take months or even years, uh, we got the plans put out in, in literally days or, or even weeks. So uh, it, it was very impressive. Um, many people were working very long hours back, uh, back when we were putting these things together. Next slide, please. And this just shows the progress right now. Um, you can see that the uh, uh, all the girders are set. We've got the reinforcing steel up on top of the deck, getting close to um, being able to pour the concrete bridge deck. These bridges, um, the permanent bridges on Niobrara and on the Spencer Dam project will be open um, late this fall. Next slide. South of Stanton, uh, this was a bridge you can see in the upper right that the approach got washed out. You know, it seems like a pretty easy thing to go back in and, and fill in the hole where the approach was washed out. There was some pretty significant uh, water flow through here. So it, 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 it took a lot um, on the contractor's part to get this filled back in. You can see the significant amount of, of fill that was placed on the left, uh, left pitcher. And if you go to the next slide, Sarah. And this shows the, on the downstream side, um, you know, from the water line up to where the fill was is about 25 feet. So a significant amount of fill that was washed out of here. Uh, we got it reestablished. There were, there actually was some damage to the pier uh, that we had to take care of prior to opening the bridge too. So um, with a lot of these um, sites, we really didn't, uh, it, was, it was hard to tell how much damage there was until you really got out and looked at these things a little bit closer. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is Pender Highway 94, just uh, Pender East Project Highway 94, just, just directly east of Pender. Um, this was a pretty tough one because the stream had degraded and you can see on the left side all the, um, the soil that had sloughed off of this fill. And if you look a little bit farther to the left in these pictures, that wall is actually the levee wall that protects Pender. So we really had to um, come back in and reestablish these banks in order to protect that levee wall. Um, contractor did a great job here. You, this is one um, looking upstream to the north. And next slide, Sarah. And this one shows the bridge uh, both before and after looking um, downstream. 
looking south back towards Pender. Uh, so pretty significant amount of work, a lot of, um, a lot of rock, rock riprap that was placed. Um, and back in the time, it was really hard to find rock riprap because we were using it on a lot of projects. Uh, next slide, please. SRAM Road looks like a little project, but really um, a difficult project because this road runs right along the Platte River. Uh, there's a lot of shale outcroppings and things that we had to account for. And uh, you can see where this bank had just sloughed off. Um, on the right side, the contractor did an excellent job to reestablish this embankment and to make our road safe again. Um, and that, uh, that one opened October 11th. Next slide, please. This was Highway 11 south of Butte. Um, this was a tough project. This was the one I, the, the picture I showed you where all the, all the ice was up on top of the bridge. This bridge actually got moved downstream, got pushed downstream about 18 inches. So it was picked up off of its bearings. You can, on the lower left, that shows the, those circles is where the, the girders used to set. So this bridge got picked up and moved downstream. Uh, the contractor needed to come back in, pick up the bridge, put it in place, and then straighten all the pieces of steel, uh, the, the beams, the girders, the cross frames that got damaged. Uh, so this one, um, uh, we did get out and take a very good look at this bridge. There were some of the parts of the bridge we really couldn't um, get to because we were concerned about the stability of the bridge. So we really did, um, we did a lot on the fly during construction to make sure this bridge was safe. Uh, the contractor put a new uh, concrete deck on it. You can see him pouring that in the bottom right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, south of Yankton, uh, just a small bridge, but uh, you can see how it washed or degraded the stream. Uh, this bridge was scheduled to be replaced in a year anyhow, so we just accelerated the construction. And this bridge was open December 19th. Next slide. And the last bridge um, that was um, open to traffic, uh, Highway 13 east of Hadar. And you can see on the right side, um, the, the bottom right picture, we, we did underwater inspections on all our damaged areas where we, can, we could get in. The bottom right picture basically shows that this old bridge was sitting on timber piling and those timber piling basically got washed out. So this bridge, you know, typically the foundation holds up the bridge. Uh, in this case, because the piling were gone or, or missing or got washed away, the bridge is actually holding up the foundation. So. This bridge had to be uh, replaced, and you can see on the left where um, the new bridge opened uh, February 7th. Next slide, please. So what now? You know, we've been through a series of lessons learned, you know, talking about communication, uh, talking about coordination with our partners, Federal Highway, our consultant industry, our contractor industry. Um, and so we can prepare for the next event. You know, we don't know when that's going to be. <laughs> we never do, but uh, we just need to be ready for when something happens. It may be a flood and it may be something else. Um, we're looking at resiliency, system resiliency, um, not only on the state system, but like at the Niobrara River. You know, there are many, many bridges, both state and county bridges. So we really need to look at, and we have looked at and continue to look at, you know, where, where can we get across these rivers when we have a major event like and this was a major event. And then even though it's been, uh, we don't have flooding issues right now as far as rainfall, there are still some groundwater events happening <clears throat> where we've got high groundwater tables that we're still dealing with. So we're not out of the woods yet. Um, of course, with the, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it makes things a little more difficult, but uh, you know, we're, we're working as we normally work. We're just doing a little bit different now. And next slide, please. So uh, questions, if you have them, this, this picture is probably, the, I think my favorite picture, this just shows the bridge that had floated away and, and where it wound up. And like Director Schneeweiss said, uh, you know, we're really uh, cautious about, you know, buckle up and phone down. We want people to be safe. We're out there working and, and we want you to be safe, but we also want our workers to be safe when you're driving by. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> As usual, very informative. Any questions for Mark or Amy? 
Well, again, it looks to me like everybody uh, did a lot of work on these, and I think uh, uh, listening to different people talk that everybody's very appreciative of the quick response that you guys made and all your district staff made. And and uh, again, uh, we need to thank the contractors for making themselves available and getting in there and getting this work done in a timely manner uh, to get uh, the transportation system put back in place. So. Again, many thanks to many different people for uh, dealing with this circumstance. Jim, thank you for those words. Mark, thanks for your presentation, Amy. I mean, I, I, there's not much more to say. Uh, it, the pressure really is on the revenue side now and trying to get those reimbursements done. And, uh, you know, to be 14 months past the flood and uh, still working to try and get some of that money flowing is proving to be uh, a frustration for us, but it's something we're working through and. And it's amazing how fast you can build a bridge and then and then how long you can work to get the money moving. And so, uh, you know, we'll keep we'll keep pushing there and, and keep updating you, but it's getting to be more of a challenge because of the revenue situation. So we need to find a way to get through some of those hurdles and the partnerships we have to do that are are, are pretty important. Okay, we'll move on. <clears throat> uh, this is the part of the agenda that uh, puts us at public input. Uh, if you have questions or want to make a comment, please click on the hand symbol and Sarah will call on you. When she unmutes your line, please state and spell your name for the record. Uh, before we start, are there any letters for the record? If so, please hand them to Sarah at this time and she will read them into the record. Um, I didn't receive any, so um, we can move past the letters. Okay. Uh, public comment. Anyone out there who wishes to address the commission? Sounds pretty quiet, Sarah. Are you getting anything? I'm not seeing any hands being raised. Okay. <clears throat> Well, again, I would ask one more time if there's any uh, public comment uh, to be brought to the commission this morning. Hearing none and seeing none, then uh, we'll move on to the next item and that's remarks from the chair. Uh, I would just like to thank all the presenters uh, today. Uh, this is our first meeting in a virtual format. And I think everybody did a great job, very informative information. I know that uh, I personally have been concerned about some of the revenue numbers that I've been seeing floating around. And as Kyle just mentioned, uh, it's going to be something that we're all going to be watching here over the next few months to see what kind of impact uh, that has had. So again, thanks to all the presenters for the work they did in putting the presentations together. Uh, special thanks to Sarah. Uh, I think for our first attempt at uh, having a virtual meeting, uh, that she did an excellent job. And I know even myself had a few issues here this morning uh, that she worked me through. And so again, Sarah, special thanks to you for getting this all coordinated and set up. Uh, <clears throat> and thanks to all uh, of everybody, uh, all the other people who are involved with this meeting who are either listening in my phone uh, or uh, uh, watching here on the video. So. Again, we always appreciate the public's interest in what we're doing here uh, in the transportation field. <clears throat> With that, Sarah, I guess that's about all I have to say. So if you would uh, move into the public meetings calendar. Um, currently, we have no public meetings scheduled. Um, we are moving some to virtual meetings. So you will be seeing that come out through um, NDOT press releases in the next month or two. Um, as of right now, the next scheduled meeting that we have for the Highway Commission is tentatively scheduled for June 26, um, and that's supposed to be an alliance, but we will keep everybody posted on um, how that will go about. But that's all I have for right now. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments from commissioners? Any other items that we need to discuss here uh, before we uh, move to adjournment? Hearing none and seeing none, 
uh, I would de declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Nice job today. Appreciate your help. Thank you, everyone.